Good morning and welcome to this week's Grow, where we gather to recharge, organize, and work here as members of MWEG. Um, we are so glad that you are here with us today. Glad to see some faces that are familiar to our Grows and welcome you back. Um, this week, we have Melanie Dixon Tag, and I just wanted to um, tell a little bit about her before she gets started. She has a bachelor's in science and civil engineering from BYU and working in her early career in the automobile accident reconstruction industry, which sounds super in interesting and um, kind of, she's taken a, a little bit of a, a diversion from that with this project. She is currently an educator by trade and an advocate for the public square for civility and unity. She is a member of the Community Levy Association and directs the Venn Diagram Project. She's been, um, she's been a guest contributor to Public Square Magazine and an essayist for the recently published Deseret Book Collection, No Division Among You. So if you've read that, then she may be familiar, her name. She and her husband, Darren, live in Northern Virginia and have seven children. One, um, one is deceased and 16 spectacular grandchildren. In addition to love of family and faith, she enjoys playing the piano and violin, reading biographies, volunteering, um, she volunteers with Catholic Charities and works in the temple near her and spends time with her dear friends. So we're so glad that she is going to talk to us today um, and share some of what the Venn Diagram Project is and what they're working on and um, let a couple other people in. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Melanie to share with us. There she is. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, yep. everybody. I have been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, at the Venn Diagram Project, we do a lot of presenting, and the profile of each group is different. And, and the profile of this group feels like home to me. Uh, strong, faithful women uh, eager to do good in the world. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, one of my dearest relatives, Ashley Dixon, um, is one of your own. So I'm eager to see if she logs on, but uh, she and I visit about Wegman, uh, MWEG often and fondly. So good to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. There will be time um, to uh, have questions and to talk at the end, but this will definitely be conversational during. I am more than happy to hear from any and all of you as we go along. So uh, don't hesitate. I might not see your hand raised since I'm the one sharing the screen, but just feel free to jump in anytime you want to enlarge on something, have ask a clarifying question, or even better, uh, make a comment that make can make our work better and more effective. So I've titled our discussion today, Seek to Moderate and Unify. These words are taken directly from a talk by uh, President Oaks, given in April 2021 general conference. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing that all of you, if not most of you remember this talk because it was so uh, uh, not intuitive that he gave a talk on the constitution of the United States on Easter Sunday in general conference. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about why he would feel uh, on the day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord to talk about these principles. And, I, and I've and i come to see how um, they are one and the same, that that as, as folks that propose, pur purport to be disciples of Jesus Christ, that this notion of, of unifying with our neighbor is integral to the Easter message, not ironically, after all. Um, so he invited us on contested issues we should seek to moderate and unify, and this has kind of become the the um, uh, informal motto of our little effort, which is called the the Venn Diagram Project. As I, uh, I'll tell our story, and then we'll come back to this moderating and unifying idea and how that applies. Um, I had I had the opportunity oh fifteen years ago, maybe twenty years ago now to hear um, Ellie Wiesel uh, give a lecture here in our area. I had read along with one of our children, his book, Night, which is his memoir. 
about um, his concentration camp experience during World War II and the now well-known Holocaust that was going on during that time. And that was in pre-internet days. So I read Night and I thought, I um, am gonna to, uh, hold looking into what kind of a man he has become. He ends the book at age 15 when he's released from the concentration camp and set up my own surprise experience to see what kind of person he'd become uh, these, these many, many, many years after his in imprisonment and was delighted and highly moved to find that he had um, lived a life of a redemptive, peaceful philosophy um, that, that, that life could and should be spent in reconciliation. He, he told this very secular audience, um, uh, he, he walked us through a little bit of Genesis and said, if you take out some of the, the, the backstory, you know, creation and all of that sort of thing, and you really finally get to the family narrative of Adam and Eve, the first action that moves that narrative is brother killing brother, is Cain killing Abel. And, and Mr. Wiesel poses the question, why would that be? Why would... Why would God and all of the preservation that he went through to get the scriptures recorded and distributed to the human family, why would that be the first narrative in the story? And his proposal is because where there are two people, there will be conflict. And you're right now thinking, oh yeah, I'm thinking of one of my kids. I'm thinking of my spouse. I'm, I'm thinking of a coworker. Even people I love, admire, respect, there's always an element to some degree or another of conflict. And then he proposed the rest of scripture is to help us to learn how to overcome that conflict, that that was kind of God's foundational springboard to get us to see you live in it. Now let's talk about how to live in it in divine ways. Uh, not at that lecture nor in the book night, but at another occasion, he said the following, the opposite of war is not peace, it is understanding. And we find that to be true in polarized issues People think if they keep religion and politics off the table at Thanksgiving dinner or at the family reunion, that they are having a peaceful coexistence. Uh, I would propose that we really achieve peace when at the Thanksgiving table, I tell you why I have come to the conclusion that I will vote for this candidate. And you will tell me about why you have decided to vote for the other candidate. And we will come away each better understanding how rational people can come to different conclusions given fairly similar data. And so the Venn Diagram Project seeks to really dive into this understanding part in order to achieve peace, as opposed to just uh, being quiet or speaking nicely. We think that understanding really can uh, carry the day. Uh, there's data to support these phenomena of, of conflict and contention that Ellie Wiesel lays out. This study is from 2019, Pew Research, um, just showing how uh, using the polarized notion of party politics, how each side thinks the other side is closed-minded, unintelligent, immoral, lazy, unpatriotic. While that alone uh, might be troubling enough, Pew has continued to study this and come to the conclusion that all of these perceptions are increasing in quantity. So um, we not only think that the people that disagree with are stupid, Every day we think they're more stupid. So um, that's problematic. Um, so um, just because we're called the Venn Diagram Project, and you guys all know what a Venn Diagram is, but we'll throw up a sample just in the event that you've forgotten from elementary school. A um, couple of circles, uh, the things that are in the overlap are the things that the two items have in common, and the things on the outside are the things where they are different. Uh, lots of really fun sample Venn diagrams. If you Google uh, Venn diagram humor, there are a lot of excellent examples of Venn diagrams out there. We believe that when people gather together and build relationships of trust uh, and seek to understand each other better on a singular issue on which they disagree, that there is always something in the middle that the, the rancor, the perception that the person that you disagree with is less than 
keeps us from seeing that in fact there are things in the middle. And so the Venn diagram project seeks to ratchet down the noise, ratchet down the rancor, the anger, the unkindness, the perceptions that the other guy is either evil or stupid or whatever, simply to discover what's already in the middle. Um, so this beautiful building is the Loudoun County Courthouse. I live in Virginia, Northern Virginia in Loudoun County, about an hour west of DC. And um, you might've seen us on the news about three years ago in 2021. The, I'm going to just tell you kind of the narrative of our, of our origins because it also describes what we do. So um, the state of Virginia mandated that every school system um, adopt by the start of school in the fall of 2021, a transgender protection policy. And in that mandate, they uh, developed a 20 page document with really good instructions of how to go about doing that some sample ideas, some things to consider, um, even some warnings about how polarizing and contentious it might be in ways that they might um, have a smooth ride toward establishing a policy like this. Uh, Loudoun County developed its own two-page policy. They used their own standard procedures for the good or the bad um, at sending the policy through committee, having it looked at by a lot of different people and then bringing it to public comment in the spring of 2021. By the time it came to public comment, it created outrage. Uh, the, the, those on the more conservative um, right side of the issue found it abominable, atrocious, dangerous. Uh, there, was, there was high opposition to it. Um, the school board, who was the body that would vote on whether or not the policy was accepted, was uh, it's supposed to be a nonpartisan body. Uh, the school board members, when they run for office, party affiliation is not listed on the ballot, um, but they were very well known as all left-leaning uh, with the exception of one. And so it was a given that the policy would pass by the school board, but they were just having to go through the process of public comment and, and uh, public input. Uh, there were a couple of meetings, one in particular, where the commenting was so rancorous uh, that there was police presence. The meeting was shut down. There were arrests. There were even some minor injuries. It was pretty mob-like. Um, I, I attended the meeting virtually. It was kind of on the back end of COVID. And I, have I really honestly had never in my life heard anyone, much less publicly, say as heretical things about Jesus as I heard in that meeting. And I had never heard publicly anyone say as hateful uh, of things about our LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters as I heard at that meeting. Uh, it was awful, it was personal, it was ugly. Um, and I found that I didn't care so much about the policy. I cared about the, the, the tone, the, the method was just, uh, I kind of, my blood's boiling, just even remembering it, thinking about it. And so, um, so with some friends, we got talking about what can we do so that this is a measured, moderated and unified dialogue. Uh, we weren't even thinking that much about outcome as much as we were thinking about how can we affect the tone. We reached out to school board members and and did quite a campaign to get those that were in powers of decision making decisions of power and decision making to participate with us in slowing this down and tampering the tempering the tone. And we got zero response. A lot of these school board members, at least two, were under election recall efforts. It was a very embattled time and a very embattled school board. So then we thought, well, why don't we just make it up? Why don't we just do something? Uh, to affect the tone, not knowing what it is we do, and, and see what happens. So diving in, having no idea what we were doing, we thought, let's try ourselves to bring together people on opposite sides of this issue and see if they can speak kindly. As we talked about it, we found how reminiscent what we wanted to do was of Utah's Fairness for All efforts back in, I'll say 2015, but in that general timeframe. And um, 
so we we talked to a lot of people. We our, our new seventy uh, Alexander Dushku. He was so helpful to us. He was a lead attorney on fairness for all, and and he gave us just extraordinary counsel and insight on what we were diving into. We talked to people with uh, way smarter than we were that knew about uh, uh, human relationships and how to build trust and and find ways to get people that might otherwise feel acrimony to feel trust. And, and, and so we took our informal training from all of these wonderful, generous, educated people. And we, we just hopped on the phone and started calling all the people we could that either hated or loved the policy. We uh, found participants. We found about a dozen people that were willing to participate. So we're thinking we're, we're, uh, it doesn't take long before your head gets big and you think you're doing something really grand. We set a date, we crafted an agenda, we sent it out and everybody on the LGBTQ plus side pulled out when they saw who was attending from the religious right side um, because there was no trust because they had been in the arena with certain folks before and found that it wasn't uh, either productive or safe. Um, so then we, that was a big learning curve for us is that they maybe didn't trust us enough to know that they could participate in this exercise, that there was no plan for ambush, that there was no ulterior agenda. So we had separate meetings. Uh, we met with the religious right side separately and we met with the LGBTQ plus side separately. Our process is very simple. We go around the table every agenda item, every person speaks without interruption on every item on the agenda. And the first item is cheesy and oversimplistic. And that's simply um, to share. We give some suggestions like, what's your favorite meal? Or what's a, a, a fun childhood memory? Or what's the best advice you've ever been given? Or what do you do with your discretionary time? Or, you know, just really kind of dumb icebreaker stuff. And in every case, we've done this many, many times now, in every case, the temperature goes down and uh, people, uh, the humanity takes the place of the rancor. And people will say, what? You went to Lake Winnipesaukee every summer? I did too. Where did you stay? Um, it, it, uh, it, it's amazing that such a simple thing can have such a big effect. We then go around the table does everybody trust each other enough to do the next question? And we we only proceed if there are enough yeses. And if there aren't unanimous yeses, we go back and repeat the previous step. The next question is, with whatever the issue of the, the day is, tell us about your interest in that issue. So in the case of our LGBTQ plus and religious right friends, there was great candor in sharing about their own personal experiences with gender, uh, fluidity or with loving a child who's been harmed as a result of being public about their gender issues. We learned about religious right folks, abject fear of, of their children using bathrooms and going on overnight field trips with uh, uh, maybe in intimate spaces with folks of an opposite gender. Um, and having done this, we learned a ton and we all at the same time felt terrified to bring these groups together and ready to bring these two groups together. Thankfully, in the case of this first foray of ours, everyone agreed to go the next step and meet with the other side. So on an August day in 2021, we had a conference room that was had nine of us in it, three folks from the Venn Diagram Project, three folks advocating for the transgender policy, and three folks opposed to the transgender policy. We followed the exact same process cheesy get to know you exercises that magically brought humanity into the room. Um, open and candid sharing about issues when we asked why, what brings you to the table? What's your interest in this issue? And then I neglected to say, then our next question is, after having listened to everyone, have you heard anything in the middle? In this particular maiden voyage, immediately a Muslim conservative participant and the president of our largest LGBTQ plus advocacy group, who is also gender fluid, um, within 30 seconds, they almost uh, parroted each other saying, our children need privacy. Our children need the dignity of privacy. And that kind of 
we coalesced around that, how the reasons for wanting and needing privacy are different, but that that might be a common um, application that everybody could be happy about. That meeting lasted three hours. And from that meeting over a few days, we um, folks from each of those three groups, anti, pro and neutral, develop a Google doc with where we each contributed statements that we thought reflected what was in the middle. And then we voted on those statements and we decided only those that had unanimous votes from all participants would then be sent to the school board. Um, 10 statements were proposed, eight were agreed upon unanimously, amazingly, by, an other, by a group that two months earlier needed police protection to get along with each other. Um, that, that meeting ended with hugs, with exchange of contact information, with beautiful, beautiful goodwill among people that otherwise would be enemies. Um, all through the process, we were letting the school board know what we were doing. And, and we were letting the press know what we were doing. And none of them would respond to us until they found out that there had been some agreement. And then the school board, our phones rang off the hook for three days between when we shared with them our unanimity statements and the date of the vote. Um, as a result of that, some of our statements were proposed as amendments to the policy and accepted. And so things are happening differently in Loudoun County than they would have had we not participated in that exercise. Um, so that's kind of our origin story. Um, and, it, and it has informed everything else we have done since then. We've learned a ton of lessons. So let me move through these lessons. And Rachel, uh, I'm sensitive to time. What should I be looking at in terms of time? Um, we usually go between 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, okay, we can do that. Thank you. Um, one of the things we learned, and, and I'm, let me say here before I rifle through these lessons learned, we have now applied the, the Venn diagram project process uh, to a lot of issues. We've applied it to abortion. Uh, our pro-choice and pro-life friends have agreed on five unanimous statements that they have uh, said, we have a green light to share with the press on our website. Um, some of them don't want people to know they are participants because they uh, are elected officials that they fear that'll interfere with their elected process. But anyway, we've applied these, these processes to abortion, to guns. Um, we're just about to embark on parental rights in the school arena, which doesn't have two clear sides. And so it'll be our first foray into a, an issue that has a lot of contention, division, and difference without two clear sides. So we'll see if our if our methods can apply there. We're smack dab in the middle of working on bringing together Loudoun County Republican Committee leadership and Loudoun County Democratic Committee leadership. And, and these are the first folks that by definition, no, I shouldn't say by definition, these are folks whose job it is to beat the other side, right? Um, they have the most to lose in looking like they are moderating. And uh, so it's a tough sell. We've met with the Republican leadership and the Democratic leadership separately. They are not sure yet that they are willing to meet together. Um, so that's a work in progress, stay tuned. So, but let's use our transgender policy versus religious right uh, uh, for this first lesson learned. Panel formation is tricky and important. When we met separately with the religious right and the, and the transgender folks, um, we found that it turned in our minds into kind of an audition and that there were folks on the religious right that in that spirit did not look like good faith participants. Uh, their anger was too high. We didn't trust that we could maintain a safe space if they participated when we brought both sides together to the table. And they were not happy with us when we didn't invite them back to our, to our next session where we were all together. So we have learned a lot of diplomacy in the process but we've also learned um, that vetting and selection of who participates matters. It's, a, it's been a weird phenomena. The more entrenched someone is in a point of view, the less likely they are to believe the notion that they should moderate, much less unify. And so on the one hand, you know, you want, you want the president of the NRA at the table, because that's a, that's a big get to, to have him or her um, 
try to find conciliation with those that are in favor of gun control measures. But the likelihood that he'd be a good participant is very low. And so we have found that we have to strategize selecting people um, that have a clear interest and role in the issue, um, but that see this as a good idea. I'll say it this way. We went in thinking that helping people find the middle would be the hard lift. The hard lift has been convincing people that finding the middle is a good idea. Um, so we've learned that primarily in panel formation. We've learned uh, very critically that vocabulary matters, that words matter. When we worked on the abortion issue, we found that all of our participants that were pro-choice did not like the moniker pro-choice. They felt like that made them sound abortion hungry. Uh, we found that all of the participants on the pro-life side did not like the pro-life moniker because they felt like that made them sound insensitive to women and their issues. And so we have a strong policy that we'll do our best to not use charged language ever in our 24 hour news cycle soundbite world when we're in these panels. And if someone inadvertently does, we'll offer them some grace and forbearance for not really knowing instead what to say or how to talk about something. We have not yet succeeded at creating a panel of those on both sides of the gun issue. And the reason is simply because of words. We met with some, it wasn't some NRA folks, but some folks that were part of a Virginia organization that is a, is a close first cousin to the NRA. And, and while they were skeptical of our goals, they were skeptically willing to participate. And they said, but with one condition, we hate the phrase gun violence because we don't feel like guns commit violence. We feel like humans commit violence. And so, so we want people to not use those words. We feel like that sends a message contrary to what we're promoting. And we said, okay, whatever, we'll try that. So then we met with our friends who were interested in a variety of ways. You know, not everyone's interested in full on gun control. There, there was high participation from, from a group of mothers interested in safe gun storage, which is you know, a little bit different than, than gun control. They were, they were also skeptical, but willing to meet with the other side. And we shared the condition. Are you willing to avoid the phrase gun, uh, gun violence? And one of the women in the mother's group for safe gun storage was an officer in that group. And she showed us the sound bites that they're supposed to share, that they have to as an obligation of their, of their office. And gun violence is one of the phrases that they are supposed to use. So they could not agree to the condition. And so simply due to language, for now, those sides won't talk to each other. I think in every issue, in every division, whether it's a family conflict, a, a large scale conflict, a community conflict, uh, we have to find words that allow us to seek that understanding that Ellie Wiesel talked about and stop being divided um, using charged language. Um, our whole philosophy is based on trust and the optimism that in fact, you can build trust. When we uh, met together with the LGBTQ plus folks and the religious right folks, there was one woman who was an officer in the local LGBTQ plus advocacy group who was the most distrustful of the other side. And every agenda item, we'd go around the room and we'd say, does everybody, do you trust enough to go to the next agenda item? And she was always reluctant. Every, every time she was reluctant. But bless her, she went out on a limb and said, yes, I guess I do. I do. I'm willing to say I do so that we can move to the next thing. Uh, without that, there is no forward progress. And only with that is there foreign progress. I, I do have to say in that case of the religious right and, and the LGBT, LGBTQ plus folks, that policy was going to pass as is whether we did something or not. And so those LGBTQ plus folks who feel very vulnerable in the public square for all the reasons they did not need to participate. They, it was not clear that they had anything to gain by participating with us, other than maybe building up new goodwill with groups that otherwise felt disparagingly towards them. Um, and so my hat's off to them for 
being willing to trust folks that they found personally very untrustworthy without any uh, self-interested motive, uh, it would appear. Uh, I've alluded to this already. There is always, always some already existing overlap. When we met separately with the pro-choice and the pro-life panels, we met with the pro-choice folks first. Um, and as they were departing, we'd finished the meeting, everybody was packing up and leaving, and one of them said, I just wish the other side knew that we love women and families, that we love children, that we're not crazy. We just have a great interest in the support and promotion of family. After we met with the pro-life group and we were packing up, it was as if they had listened in. One of them said in frustration, I just wish the other side knew how much we loved women and children and families and that they just knew that we weren't crazy, but they, it was identical. These folks had huge things in the middle and they had no idea because they felt completely misunderstood as the rancor and the rhetoric took the place of any listening and understanding. Um, don't obsess over end results. Let the definition of success evolve. So when we started this notion, we were obviously working on a particular policy and so results had clear definition. When we started just kind of voluntarily putting together panels on issues that we knew were contentious, whether there was any um, policy uh, movement going on at the time, that made results kind of different. You know, results might be an op-ed. Results might be um, uh, publishing something. Results might be uh, sharing results with elected officials to inform what and how they're approaching contentious issues. We had a, a woman here in this area getting a degree in uh, conflict resolution, a master's degree at the Jimmy Carter School at George Mason University, do case studies on us. And we did lengthy, lengthy interviews with her as she did different projects and papers. And, and she kept pushing, how do you measure your results? How do you measure your results? And this was good for us to have to think about how do we measure results. And, and what we came to was the process, the success is if the process even happens. The success is the people sitting at the table be, being willing to pro, uh, participate. And so, so we don't measure results in terms of we have affected this many bills that have been passed. We have... Um, you know, we share how often we've been published, different things like that, but more to get this, the process out there than the, than the publishing as success per se. The success is in people agreeing that their otherwise opponent has value, has something to say, and maybe even is rational, rational and reasonable in the differences that they have with us. Uh, we let the panel actually, when there is no legislation on the table specifically, when we're just doing this for finding the middle, the panel decides what do we want to do with these results? How do we want to share them? What's the best way to get the word out that we've done what we've done? Um, this one is huge. This is a this is a um, a perspective approach that is in short supply in our day. Listening, learning, and understanding can always, and I might say should always, precede or replace persuading and winning. Many of the reasons people don't want to talk about these polarized issues is because they feel so strongly about their side that they've come to feel like the conclusion that they've come to is the only good conclusion that someone can come to. And if it's the only good conclusion that someone can come to, then that must make the other person wrong and we need to persuade them to think what we think about whatever the issue is. At the very least, that's arrogant. Um, at the, perhaps at the very worst, it's not divine, right? We, as members of the church, we really value certainty. We really value clinging to absolutes. Uh, at the Venn Diagram Project, we suggest that maybe there aren't as many absolutes as people think there are. Maybe the list of absolutes is quite short and everything else is in play. Everything else is in the table. 
And who among us that claims to be a disciple wouldn't want to learn more about anything in case they weren't getting it right, in case maybe there was more to learn or, or more to understand. And so we work hard on these panels that we conduct to never ever allow persuasion or victory um, to be the climate. Uh, we are simply trying to find where do we already agree, not how can I get you to be different. Now, having said that, that leads to the next lesson. So, if so, so far, every panel we've conducted, we have found things in the middle. It's it's it it. Uh, I'm so optimistic about this that I think this can work 100% of the time. Um, however. The next step would be for participants to consider whether or not there's anything they could change about what they think about something. Finding the middle is just leaving us as we are and learning to understand each other. And I, and I should have said earlier, which I didn't, we love the middle, right? We love to help everybody find the middle. But once you find the middle, that allows you to enjoy learning about each other in your differences too. Okay, we're not just saying, okay, now we can talk about what's in the middle. You know, if Rachel and I did a Venn diagram project, we might find out that she likes yoga and I like baseball. If we find, if we, if we know we have things in the middle, if the humanity's there, she, she could try to understand from me what's my love affair with baseball. And I'd learn from her about her love affair with yoga. And that enhances both of us. I'd have a greater likelihood of trying yoga. And she might come to a Nationals game with me the next time she's in town. The, the, the outside of how we're different enriches us as much as what we discover that's in the middle. But what's in the middle and what's on the outside is fluid, not stagnant. And, and we need to know each other well enough, maintain relationships enough that we allow ourselves and other people to let that be fluid, to change and grow. Having said that, we assure all Venn Diagram Project participants that no one will ever invite them to abandon or change what they consider, and they get to be the judge and arbiter, to be their core principles. Um, so we are not in the business of persuading anyone away from their own personal mission statement. Um, we are asking them to listen and learn to see how someone different from them might be the same in some ways, and then to subsequently appreciate those differences. Um, but for sure, compromise is the big frontier. Not everybody even thinks compromise is a good word. Um, this work that we do is um, possible to do everywhere. We have chosen, so we do two main things at the Venn Diagram Project. We locally continue to create and impanel on issues and see where we can find middle ground in all different arenas. Um, and the reason we only do it locally is because we believe, because it's so trust-driven, that it's by definition relationship-driven. And it would be very challenging for me to go conduct a panel in Peoria, Illinois, with people I'd never met before. It'd be possible, but it'd be even better if they were my neighbors and my colleagues and my, um, my community members. And so we impanel locally, but we talk about it everywhere we can to hopefully inspire other people either to join us and use our specific methods or to find their own way, but to take this notion that we can in fact moderate and unify to their arena, to their world. Um, this same uh, woman that I was telling you about that was studying conflict resolution at George Mason, she shared, she got eight pluses on all of her projects that featured the Venn diagram project. So we're super proud of her. And she shared her um, professor's remarks with us after she was done. And in one place, he made a comment where he said, you know, these guys are using methods that are tried and true. I cannot figure out how they knew what to do. And uh, there are credentialed people out there. And yet these uncredentialed people are doing this thing. And then he wrote a thing that changed the Venn diagram project. He wrote on her paper, and why not? And I used to feel a little apologetic to audiences that I was not more credentialed. And now my motto is, and why not? I'm every man, right? I'm every woman. If I can do this, 
anybody could do this where they are in the issues that surround them that are rancorous and um, and keeping us from uh, the peaceful existence that I think all of us as members of the church with the, the beautiful expressions of our current prophet uh, strive for to achieve, to be peacemakers. And not just so that we ourselves are peacemakers, but so that our climate becomes peaceful as a result of us being peacemakers. And so what is the Venn Diagram Project? It's a bunch, bunch of interested people that seek to implement the prophetic invitation on contested issues to moderate and unify. I used to think in the early days of this that finding unity is the hard, the hard ask, the heavy lift. I now think it's moderate. We are asking people, take things that you feel passionately about, maybe that you've given your life's work to, and step down off the podium a little bit, step back a little bit from sound bites and um, passionate points of view, both about the ideas and the personnel, and listen and seek to learn, seek to more fully understand, seek to moderate. And we're finding that where good people are willing to moderate, unity just kind of beautifully fills in the space uh, where people have moderated. So thanks for listening. That is the Venn diagram project in a nutshell. Um, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from your thoughts on critique, how we could do better, gaps in what we're doing. And I'd love to answer your questions or um, exchange ideas with you. I Let me say one thing. I'm gonna put our um, website in the chat and uh, we are so young and so fledgling that we finally just got funding for a website. So it is heavily under construction um, and it'll look different to you every day if you go to look at it, but we're getting there. So there's our website. I agree with you, Diana, that compromise, I'm just preaching, I'm preaching 1700s US politics pretty much, um, right? Right, and those and those beautiful participants broke bed to get bread together. They even slept in the same beds together at night. Um, so, yeah, if we didn't, if they hadn't a compromise, we wouldn't have a country. Right, right. Uh, compromise is a beautiful thing, and I do think it can be manipulated to be worrisome, but it need not be a bad word. Well, the other thing is, families couldn't exist without compromise. They that would be. Not fighting each other all the time. Kids that's, my, that's my experience as well. So I don't know why, I don't quite understand why compromise has become a bad word. Yeah. I sort of do, but I, it's just, it's nuts. Yeah, we, we um, uh, this past uh, Tuesday night, we met with the leaders of our local Republican committee at a Venbot diagram panel. And that very question came up. Um, one participant said to a Republican leader, teach us um, why you're opposed to compromise. And he gave an, an uh, explanation that made complete and total sense to him. And it helped me to better understand why he was averse to it. He lives in a world of elections where winning and losing does matter. And, and uh, compromise, uh, the appearance of, of weakness leads to elective loss and uh, so you can see how things, you know, some might think that sounds twisted. I think my job is to learn. Okay, now that I know that that's the arena you're in, let's start from there. Yeah, and it seems often that compromise, people feel like they're giving up something that's important to them. And I, I, I don't feel like, I don't see it that way. I feel like it's, as you've talked about, it's coming to an understanding or an agreement versus, you know, so I, I think if you look at it in the positive light versus the negative, right, you can look at it two different ways, like, oh, I'm giving up so that I can come to your side versus, oh, I'm going to understand better. So like you said, that we can, we can, you know, you were saying, if, if I talk to this person and we, uh, and the vocabulary and the different things that we can actually be at the table together because we understand better what 
where each side is coming from um, is, yeah, and, is kind of looking at it in a positive way. Yeah. yeah. And, and on some level, when the, when the process really is magical, there's this kind of transformative zone where people stop seeing themselves even as sided. They, they are enjoying finding the common discovery of ideas that they realize are not sided. And, and, and maybe we need to, at Venn Diagram, find a word that's different than compromise. But I think what we're saying is, in some form or fashion, compromise is the absence of sidedness. Well, yeah. I mean, if you look at what, comp if you look at really what compromise does, so I want this, they want that, and we compromise, and I get some of this, and they get some of that. Yeah. So it is It is finding the middle. I mean, compromise is finding the middle. Yeah. The some, whole point of compromise. Yeah. Sometimes it's finding something that neither side has thought of. If, if my it's husband says, yeah, if my husband says, let's get Chinese tonight, and I'll say, oh, I went out with friends today to Chinese, let's get Italian tonight. A compromise would be, okay, let's get Italian tonight and Chinese tomorrow night. A transformative idea would be, wait a minute, there's a new French place. Let's go there. And I did, no, there's no winners or losers there. We haven't had anybody have to change. We have discovered a transformative, I know it's a dumb example, but higher idea. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. What else? Now this this made me think a lot um, of what MWEG, we work with the living room conversations and, um, you know, their topics aren't policy driven, much like the Venn diagram where you're trying to get people to, to agree, you know, on, on political levels, but just the humanity side of inviting people to come together and have a conversation. But there's the way it's set up, similar to like you were saying, is that there's these levels of everybody answers the question or or shares a statement that gives a little piece of who they are and what they're about um, to the whole group. And I liked that you said humanity takes the place of the rancor. And that's just, that's so true because if we can just see people as humans, as, as neighbors and friends outside of what, you know, they're putting on their ballot or what they're, I mean, we all have reasons like you were saying, we all have reasons. We, we've got to get to the why, and so we can understand people better. And it doesn't need it doesn't necessarily need to change us. It just needs to help us understand. Yeah, I hope I hope what we hope first and foremost is that it changes us stylistically, that it that it changes our tone, it changes our point of point of view, that that it changes us enough to see our opponent in positive light instead of in negative light, like the Pew research showed. We, I didn't include this in lessons learned, but a really simple, banal, low level lesson learned is that this whole finding the humanity that you were talking about, so the rancor leaves the room, is amplified if there's cheese and crackers. If there's, if there's food in the middle of this table, everybody's nicer to each other. So, and that's humanity. That's just another version of humanity, right? We all, we all like food and, and breaking bread together is among the most beautiful symbols there is of unity and, and forbearance and acceptance to be around a common table, breaking bread, learning and understanding. So I yeah, forgot that idea up. As, as we're preparing for our voter preparation parties that MWEG has been talking about, bring some, bring some food. There you go. <laughs> so just in case the conversation gets a little bit exciting. Um, that you have something to feed them. We, um, we, well, we did not bring food yeah. to our Republican uh, panel the other night and somebody called us on it. So there will always be food from now on. Very good. Uh, if, does anybody have any other comments before we close out for today? I just wanted to I tell Melanie when I saw the picture of, of uh, that you showed at the beginning, I'm going, I've seen that many times. I live in Kentucky. Oh, so Buildings are very much like the buildings in Virginia. Yeah, Rachel thought it was a building from Boston. So um, yeah. it's beautiful architecture. We don't build them like that anymore, do we? No. 
No. Well, thanks everybody. Well, thank you, Melanie. Yeah. Yes. You thank can. you for being here. Thank you for joining us and, um, and, you know, sharing some of these insights and helping us to be better communicators. And um, that's just, that, that's something that's important as members of MWAG that we be peaceful communicators and, and giving us some skills of as we go in, we all want to have practice. I'm going to say it again. If you've never done a living room conversation, you can sign up for those on MWAG Central. Um, it, they're just small groups and it is, it's a great way to practice some of these skills um, on topics. There's, there's just such a varying of topics. So when you see something that maybe piques your interest, um, register for that so you can see what that's like, because we've had a lot of members come to us after we did our trainings uh, around the documentary of the abortion talks, that, which is very similar to the, the idea of where they had three women from each side people just kept saying, okay, this is really great, but how do I practice? How do I practice this? And so um, that's how you do it. You've got to, you've got to allow yourself to be with other, other humans, right. And, yeah. and have the dialogue and that's the best way. So I'm just going to plug that again. Um, we also want to remind everybody that we'll be back here next week. We're going to talk about our summer hope experiment. Um, you may have seen that in the newsletter or on our social media, we're going to introduce that in a little more depth next Thursday on our grow. And so if you have some questions or want some ideas, more ideas, or if you've already started and you want to share your experiences, we invite you guys to join us next week. And part of that is having conversations like, like we discussed today. So um, we invite you all to look through that and I will on MWEG Central put links to that. And um, I will add in if you ever want to go back and see the recordings of this, you can do it on YouTube, but in NYC Central, we put it um, in the events. So if you go to the events and then past events in the comment section will be the recording of today's grow. So you can do that and I'll put the link to the Venn diagram project in there as well. So thank you again so much and we will see everybody next week. Thanks everybody. Have a good day.